All right. Well, I guess maybe we'll go ahead and start going here. We don't have too many people yet have joined us, but um, so welcome. Um, we're getting kind of close to the end here. I don't know if anybody has any questions about procedural stuff right now or not. Um, I'm. I think basically I'm planning on you know just doing the our chapter here and then the next chapter for the textbook the week after that. Um, next week, um, next so next week is our last week of classes actually, and then we do have a finals week after that. I'm probably going to try just just to let you know. I, I mean, I am planning on having a second test, like like we said. Um, I'll probably go ahead and do the usual thing next week um, and post a quiz um, and maybe some problems for practice problems. People want to work on them. I'm going to try and get the second test posted up sometime next week um, and, and probably open it up next week as well. And kind of like the first one, I'll give plenty of time. Uh, but yeah, if anybody wants to try and get their stuff wrapped up uh, by next week before finals week start, um, I'll, I'll probably have it up and you'll can have an opportunity to do that if you want to. Uh, but I'll still make the, the, the due date for the test two during the finals week. So, um, so if people want the time, um, they can do it and turn in um, probably all the way till Friday on, on, on our finals week. So. Anyway, that's my plan. So we're basically going to be doing this chapter and the chapter 14 then, and that will be, up, be it for covering the things in our textbook here. Um, so yeah, I had a couple of, of, of old business things to go over first. So, well, first of all, you know, I'll see if anybody, uh, I have one or two things I could say about the problem set. So I don't know if anybody um, who's currently with me wants to discuss any of these in particular or not. Uh, of course, if you do, as usual, just speak up. Let me know if you have questions on these things. Um, so yeah, I did post the example solution, um, you know, about uh, just a, an hour or two ago. Although the first time I posted this right away after I started reading through it, I found I had at least one or two little mistakes. So hopefully nobody picked it up between when I first posted it and I posted it again about 30 or 40 minutes later. So anyway, you might want to check. My biggest mistake was I had, I kind of um, somehow had these the wrong way around in order to get the division correct. So, um, so, so yeah, if, if you have a version where I'm, where you're doing the, the uh, calculations for ABC first, that's a little bit problematic to get the division correct. If you're assuming, if, if you're assuming, uh, so for all of these, um, let, me, let me say one general thing about this for, for the question one. So this was about um, using the zero, one, two, and three address machines that we talked about architecture or setup. So by that, we mean kind of the number of, um, of, of address operands that you specify for the, the, the machine opcode, right? So either zero, although notice for zero, I mean, you still do have to have at least one operation so that you can get things on and off the stack. Well, two operations, so like a push and a pop, but otherwise, it's zero otherwise, and the special one for moving things back and forth to the stack. Um, But then the other ones are kind of, you know, so one address has just one address operand and two would have two of them and three could have up to three of them. So as we talked about last week and in our textbook, you know, the uh, three is just, um, it makes your instruction fields kind of too big. So, so not a lot of instruction set architectures use three operand or, uh, you know, a lot of instruction set architectures use um, have variable length. So have some instructions that use two uh, and maybe a few special instructions that might use three. But uh, we talked a little bit about all those things last week. So. But by far kind of the biggest is probably the kind of the two address um, uh, architecture, right? So one, the, the one address was um, 
kind of so early CPUs tend to, to rely on one address, um, but uh, but more modern x86 and and ARMs kind of use two addresses as the, as the the main um, format basically. So. So anyway, um, yeah, so there are some assumptions on these, like for example, for the zero address, if um, uh, the, the solution that I show here it assumes that the operator on the top of the stack um, it becomes the first operand, sorry, not the, op the operand, the, the, the operand on the top of the stack becomes the first one. And then the, the, the next one on the stack becomes the, the second one that you, know, that you do the operation on. So, I mean, it could be done in the other, the other way. So it could be that, that the, the first item you pull off the stack becomes the, the second operand. And then the second one in the stack ends up being the first one. And then you apply the operator in that order, right? But I think it's more common this way. So, so if you assume that the, the top of the stack becomes the first operator, so that matters for like subtraction and division. Um, so if you don't have these on the stack in the right order, so so for example, for this div division to work, you have to have the A plus BXC to be on the top of the stack. If you assume that that gets uh, popped off and becomes the first operator, and the, then you have to have the, the sub um, calculation D minus E times F as the, the, the second item on the stack, uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's a different result if you divide, you know, D minus E times F by A plus B times C. So, 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 so it does make a difference for division and subtraction that you get the order correct, right? Um, And another thing that I had a few people, a few students ask a question about, um, yeah, to me, it, it's perfectly fine to assume you have some general purpose registers for like, um, uh, for even for the one address, two address, three address. So like for the, the one address, I kind of show reusing. So, so we assume that you've got variables X, A, B, C, D, E, and F all assigned memory locations and, and A, B, C, D, E, and F all hold the initial values for for um, for those you know the, the the values for those variables, right? Um, but um, um, x is supposed to be where the ultimate result is supposed to end up being put into at the end. Thus, you need like a pop x at the end of your zero address to get the the results of all the calculations out to address x, whatever x is, right? So this is actually doing a write to, to uh, memory here. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I you know, I, I could have just used like a, a register assuming, well, for, for one address, computers, um, architectures, normally there aren't registers. So I think that that's why I, I just reused X in this example, because normally all you have is the accumulator and um, for this one to do it, I mean, you, you, you need at least one other temporary location. So, um, so, so you could just assume that you have besides A, B, C, D, E, F, and X, um, you could just assume they have another temporary location, Y, if you wanted to. Um, but, but yeah, I just show reusing X here um, to hold the, the result of, e of D minus E times F. So you have to keep that around so that you can calculate the other one and then finally do your division. So. Um, and then likewise, I, I think that this is kind of pretty normal for like the two address architectures that uh, normally the first um, Operand address is assumed to be the um, the, the um, implied destination, and that's also assumed to be the first operand. And then the second one is just the, the second operand that 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 your operator is applied to. So again, that that you know makes a difference for subtraction and um, division operations in particular. So. 
and the three address here, an example. So here, I mean, I even use uh, what two different registers, temporary registers uh, for this one. So if you only use one, you'd have to, to um, uh, potentially use more than five instructions here. So another point about this first question was, you know, it, it should in generally take more instructions to, to implement this using the zero address um, architecture um, and, and less and less to get down to, you know, three address architecture should usually has kind of the highest level instruction. So it sh should usually need require the least amount of instructions to perform the same conceptual task. So all of these were performing the same um, uh, arithmetic expression here. Um, all right, so that's the first one. If there's any questions on that, let me know. Uh, the second one, like I said, um, I'd kind of um, picked it, hadn't realized quite how difficult it was. So, Hopefully, you know, I, I posted that announcement, hopefully hoping that um, um, people wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, if they got stuck, you wouldn't spend too much time on it. Um, but um, it is possible to, for example, oh, so uh, just a couple of, of things to mention about this. So uh, for one thing, this is kind of similar to the idea of the, um, uh, the minimal um, uh, logical operator set that we talked about when we were talking about circuit design, you know. Um, so, um, so, so, you know, kind of what's the minimal instruction set that you could that you could use to uh, uh, implement a, a a machine architecture, right? Um, you know, I, I would probably say after thinking about this a little bit. You know, so maybe you could do it with just these two instructions, but um, you know, the 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 resulting machine architecture is just not going to be very practical to use, right? So, so unless there's some real good reason why you'd want to have the minimal number of instructions, um, you definitely probably want more than 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 two here. Um, so, so instead of the minimal that would actually work for instruction sets, probably the question is, what's the minimal that would be useful? And that kind of leads you to the idea of a reduced instruction set computer, I think, you know, so it's almost kind of a, the minimal that's still um, good enough that it's not too painful, you know, that you have to write hundreds of instructions that you might only need to write, you know, a dozen or so in, in a more um, CISC kind of system. Um, So I might only talk mostly about the first two. Um, so, so A was about, um, can you implement like a load in a store basically? So get something from memory to the accumulator um, and or something from the accumulator back to memory. Um, but kind of before that, when I talked about in the example solution here, um, a, a nice little uh, thing kind of preliminary to, to, to try to figure out how you can do things with just these two instructions is if you realize that there's the sequence that will actually allow you to uh, set the accumulator and a location memory to zero, this, this is useful. And it's not, it's not too tough to stumble across this. Um, so imagine that memory address zero has some value in it, Y, and the accumulator has some value X in it. But uh, so the reason why we might want to, for example, get the accumulator to be zero is, well, you know, if, if, if you want to move something to the accumulator, if you make it zero, then you can kind of see if, if I can use a subtract instruction that would kind of move the value to the accumulator, except it will be the negative of the value, right? But that's getting close. So I, I get the, the, the negative of the value, right? So the question is, if I don't, if I don't have an instruction to just store zero in the accumulator, how can I get zero there? Um, so no matter what the value is in the accumulator and why, all you have to actually do is do two subtracts, two, two subs from some location that you don't care. So you have to be careful that because that, you're going to lose this value. You're also going to lose the value in the accumulator. But as long as you have some location that you know um, that, that you can make zero, that 
they don't care if you lose the value in it. And this should make sense if you think about it um, just for a minute, because if you do a subtract zero, no matter what these two values are, the result is going to be x minus y, because when you do the sub s, the subtract s from a memory location, you take the accumulator minus the location, um, and then you store the result both back in the accumulator and in the location. That, that was the definition of this instruction here. Right, so after you do this first sub zero, you've now got X minus Y in the accumulator and X minus Y at address zero, right? And then just think about doing it again, because now you have X minus Y in both places. So if you do a subtract again, you're taking, you know, whatever X minus Y is, then it has some value, call it V. So you'd just be taking V minus V and the result is gonna be zero or X minus Y minus X minus Y, right? So that's no matter what these two values are, if you just do two subtractions in a row to the same memory location, um, you'll end up zeroing out your accumulator and zeroing out that memory address, okay? So that's useful because like I said, that, that kind of gives us all, that gives us halfway to being able to do um, the um, store something in the accumulator using just these, actually just using the one instruction, the, the subtract. We haven't had to use the jump instruction yet. Um, but again, no matter, let's say that, that your goal is to get whatever the data is at memory address seven, I wanna store that in the accumulator. So how do I write the instructions to do that? Um, well, you start off, um, and you start off by having some location that that you don't care about so that I can zero it out. Oh, and notice, I, I should have mentioned, you know, the, the program counter is starting at address one. So, so you should have, uh, you know, I should have pointed that out. So, so we're not actually executing the instruction at address zero here, whatever it is. Um, so, so these two, as we just said, will we'll zero out both X, uh, both the accumulator and address zero. Um, after this point, we still have the value Z in here. Now, like I mentioned before, if we do a subtract seven or a subtract from whatever memory location we're trying to store in the accumulator, the result is the negative of Z because we get zero minus Z and we put that in both places, right? So you get negative Z. Um, so close, but 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 we want we want z in there. We, we want to transfer z, not negative z, right? So now we have to figure out a procedure to negate that, right? So so but again, if I could somehow have zero back in the accumulator again, and I could subtract, you know, zero minus negative z would would be the the negation of it, right? So so again, we're going to go back. Um, um, so at this point, we've managed to get minus Z, but, but we also end up with minus Z in both there and our original location, right? So it, it would be safe again to just zero out um, the accumulator in Z by subtracting zero again twice, which we do here. So the result is that now we've actually, the sequence would be up to this point, we could use that to negate a value at some location, right? Uh, but then one final, now that we have zero in the accumulator, if, if I do a subtract seven, I would get zero minus negative Z, which, which would end up being zero plus Z or Z. And you'd end up with Z in the accumulator and Z in seven, okay? Which, you know, I'll point back out is, is was the original goal. Uh, you know, we wanted to figure out how do we load a value from somewhere into the accumulator, and we got exactly what we wanted. So the accumulator has whatever the value Z was, uh, not to mention we didn't clobber the value from memory either, so we still have Z in um, the original location, right? So that kind of generally works. Um, there's kind of one big problem with this though. I mean, you would really like to, to be able to package this up into a subroutine, right? But to be a subroutine, I would have to somehow replace, like, like if I wanted to load from memory address 100 in memory, I would need to re replace all of, well, these two locations that have seven with 100, right? Um, so, you know, kind of a little bit of hand waving here. So maybe there's some way that you could use a jump 
uh, the jump instruction to jump to the beginning of this to treat it like a subroutine, but, but maybe there's some other way also that before you jump to it, you could um, write in values that are some subs, subtracts, but changing the location of, to be the memory location that you want to do the, the load to the accumulator from, right? But, you know, when I think about that, I mean, that, that's not going to be an easy task uh, to, to try and generate, to try and come up with a, a general procedure for doing um, subroutine calls or procedure calls and returns um, without, without a, without a call and return instruction, which we don't, again, we don't have those. Um, um, all right, anyway, so, so that was the, like the load to accumulator. So um, you can kind of do a similar thing to do, this, to do the opposite. So to get the value from the accumulator out to somewhere in memory. Um, um, it's actually a little bit tougher uh, the, the main reason why it's tougher is because, uh, I mean, you can't do anything with the accumulator, first of all, um, or else you'll lose the value that you're trying to store, right? Uh, so, so I can't first start off by zeroing out the accumulator because then I lose the actual value that I want to move to uh, address eight in this, this case. Uh, yeah, for this one, I ended up with so many instructions, I couldn't fit them in four bits, so we had to move up to five bits. Um, for my kind of pseudo assembly language um, example here. So um, the result, and, and I think this might be a little bit cheating here, but, but kind of the only way that I can think of doing it is you have to have some location, uh, not only that, that you don't care what's in there, that, that you know has some value that you can overwrite, but that initial location has to have the value zero in it. And I can't use our first trick to make it zero, because that would lose the value in the accumulator, right? So, um, but assuming that we can figure that out somehow, to some way have a location that already has zero in it without initializing it to zero by doing two subtracts, then you do have a solution. Um, and and um, this, is, this is the solution here. It, it's kind of similar to the previous one. Now that I have the zero, or now that I have a location that I, I know has zero in it, um, I can do a subtract from zero to get Z transferred to that location, you know? So, so um, if I already had, Z, if I already knew that I had zero um, at the location where I actually want it, I could just directly have done the subtract and boom, you're done, right? Uh, but but we don't know what's there, right? We, on, we only assume that we had some location that's zero, but not the location that you want to transfer to, or I'm only assuming that. I mean, if you assume that the location you want to transfer has zeroed in it already, then, then yeah, you're done with one subtraction. Uh, but otherwise, you kind of have to first transfer it to um, location one, like I did here, or sorry, to location zero, like I did here. And then um, you can basically end up getting the negative in there. Um, and then once you have the negative, you can zero out your location eight. Um, and then you can subtract the, the, the eight from um, the, the, the um, I'm sorry, so you, well, I'm, I'm messing up the description a little bit, but 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 yeah, you can get there um, 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 with a sequence like this. So. Um, oh, and, and again, notice that um, assuming that this sweet sequence is right, you end up also with Z not only stored in, in your target location again, but you still have Z in the accumulator as well. So you didn't clobber it there. And you'll also end up with zero still at that original location. So, so pre presumably for, for um, this um, store subroutine, I could keep just reusing that as a temporary location that always starts off with zero because it ends up with zero at the end as well.
Um, all right. Yeah, and after that, I kind of think I'm I want to kind of do skip over a little bit quick quicker the the C D and E. So um, to me, I mean, thinking about these this is kind of what I what I warned about uh, in there that you know that there's certainly no obvious straight forward way to to implement like a conditional branch. There's not even an obvious routine that's that's you know like twice as big as, as any of these i don't think although if somebody has a demonstration of that i'd be interested in seeing or if you think you did i'd be interested in seeing if you can think of something so there's a general idea that might work um so if you could somehow so assume that you could somehow get um a, a jump instruction into your ac okay and then right before the location that you want to do the jump, you could subtract and, and, and you assume that the, the location where you want to actually perform the jump um, also has zero in it initially. OK, so in this case, imagine a loop where normally we want to jump back to in, um, memory address one, we could keep doing that conditionally. But then some, at some point when the loop is done, we want to, uh, instead of jumping, we want to go to instruction six. So that's what I'm kind of demonstrating here. So, so if somehow you could, could make this location be zero and, and, and have your jump one be in the accumulator, you could do a sub, sub, sub five. So you would get this minus zero. So that would end up putting one zero zero one, which is a jump to one if you assume that the first bit Means means jump, and then the, the next three bits are the address to jump to the, the absolute address. So after doing this, uh, so after executing the PC at four, um, it would put one zero zero one here, and then when you execute five, it would jump back to one. Right? But then presumably inside of here, before you get to doing the conditional jump again, you you would again have to reset this. So before you execute instruction four, you'd have to put the you know which way you want to conditionally jump into the accumulator, and you'd also also have to make certain that address five is zero. Um, but then then you know um, the the conditional part would be at some point instead of jumping back to one, I'm done with the loop, so I want to jump to six or just continue on to six. So at that point, if you could make the AC be one one zero one, that would be a jump to six instead of a jump back to one. Logical or I thought would 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 have something that you could do a subtract, but it's not it's maybe not as easy at, as I would have thought when I first um, looked at the question. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously, if, if you have an addition, I mean, uh, uh, addition and logical or bitwise logical or are um, similar, um, and if there's no carry on the addition, then the bitwise or and, and addition would be equal, right? But if there is a carry, they're not going to quite be equal. So, so if you have a carry, you might have to do some manipulation, like subtract one or, or even more. If there's a if there's a, if there's a, an overflow carry out of the addition, um, um, you have even more work than doing like a subtract one. So, but but it's possible, you know, assuming that you know you have an addition, and we already showed that you can kind of get addition. Um, that you can get your logical or by uh, using some form of a, of a regular addition, but but tr uh, treating that or transforming that to a lot a bitwise logical or here. So. Um, and for I/O operations, um, I didn't have a lot of examples a lot of idea on that i mean if uh, if it's not cheating to say well let's let's just have um memory mapped um io on the system then i mean in that case certain memory locations if they're written to or read from would actually be transferred to and from io devices and then you could use like load and store that we kind of demonstrated so that's maybe one approach you could use to say we have to have memory mapped IO to 
um, to get IO to work on this computer here. Um, all right, so anyway, that was kind of what I had for the second one. Um, um, from the third one, this has to do with um, um, the, the x86 um, section on chapter 12. Um, I can't remember the, the table number. I won't go look it up. But um, if you look up that table, you should have all the information you need for these. So. <clears throat> The basic idea being, you know, so for the first for part A, if they're unsigned integers, um, so, so so I mean, first of all, um, you really don't have to worry about the parity flag or the auxiliary carry. So parity just has to do with um, um, whether the operator operands end up aligning on boundaries or not. So that's not really kind of relevant to what we're doing here for the compare. Um, the auxiliary carry is only something that has to do with binary encoded digits binary coded decimals. Um, and the sign bit isn't useful for unsigned integers. Um, um, so it shouldn't be being set since we don't have signed results here. So, so really, you only need to look at the zero uh, in the carry flag. Um, and as, as they talk about, so compare would normally be implemented um, in the digital circuits by doing a subtraction um, and then the, the subtraction would set these flags and then you could use those for like conditional jumps. And that was kind of what the, the part C was a little bit about here. Um, but if you're subtracting, um, you're, you're subtracting the source from the destination. So you just have to be careful about that. Um, so if the, 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 the source is bigger than the destination or the destination is less than the source, um, when you subtract those, the, the, the result is going to be um, um, less than zero, which will cause a, a, a carry for an unsigned subtraction, right? Um, well, it, it's easiest to understand. If, if they're equal, of course, when you subtract them, no matter whether you do destination by source or source by destination, you, you get a zero. So the zero bit would be set um, and no carry would happen. So, so that one should be relatively obvious. Um, So here, if you're subtracting, again, if you're subtracting the source from the destination, if the destination is bigger, the result is going to be positive. So no carry occurs um, and it's not zero. So both will be zero. And then the other one, you'll get the, the carry set because you get a result that's less than zero, which you can't represent with the unsigned integer. So. Um, um, and you get a similar idea when you're doing comparing signed integers, except um, it really wouldn't be the carry flag. It would be whether you end up with a negative or, or a positive result. Um, but, but you get a similar idea. Just, just the information is, the, is in the signed flag of whether it's less than or greater than. So. <clears throat> Um, all right, so um, any, any, anybody want to ask any questions about that before I move on to last week's problem set? Not for me. Yeah, oh, okay. All right, um, yep, yeah, so anyway, that's, that's up there if, if you haven't worked on that and kind of want to um, work on those. Um, um, All right, so I had one other bit of old business that I wanted to, or well, from last week, um, re relatively quickly, I hope. Um, um, so on, on last week, week 11, which was over chapter 12, um, um, you might not have saw it, but I, I posted uh, two example programs now, and I'm going to be using this one also for some examples today about x86 memory addressing. Um, but since I got this working, I, I thought maybe I would show this. Um, but but yeah, if, if you're interested, you could try and pull down the program and, and do it yourself. Um, let's we'll start with a little Indian one here.
So let me know. I made the font a little bit bigger, hopefully. Um, uh, if that's not big enough still, let me know. So we'll make those both a little bit bigger here. Uh, let's put this over here. Okay, so um, in this one, um, I mean, you know, I, I think it's a good um, demonstration of um, uh, a couple of things, you know, so if you've never kind of looked at memory and, and how things are laid out, especially like from a compiled language like C um, here, or well, C++, C and C++, um, so we'll just create a structure here. So if you know what a structure is in C, it's, it's just a collection of a bunch of variables, a bunch of member variables, basically. Um, and, and you can treat these as like a record or, you know, so all these variables are laid together. So what happens is um, these will all be, um, um, whenever you create an instance of what I call the, the, the little Indian structure here, um, <clears throat> Uh, it will allocate enough memory to hold um, all of these values, uh, and then whatever memory it locates, it'll it'll pack all those together, basically. Okay, so let's kind of look at the layout here. Hopefully, I re I'll remember everything here. Um, so I'm going to be running the GNU debugger um, here a little bit. Um, let's see how things run. So. Um, so the GNU debugger is a, you know, kind of a command line debugger, um, but um, it works similar to um, a, a symbolic debugger that you might have worked on, on like a more uh, visual IDE. So, um, for example, we can set breakpoints. So I'll set a breakpoint here at line 69. Um, you can list the code. Um, but uh, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and run it. And we should hit that breakpoint. So, so it actually ran all these things. Um, so we had the output, the hello world, and, and, and these two things here. So um, anyway, it, 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 right now in memory, we've got this structure S, which is of the type little Indian, uh, which has all these values here. So, um, So another thing I can do is do things like um, actually execute um, some kinds of C instructions to query my program. So for example, we can ask what the size of S is. So S is actually 40 bytes. Um, so if you add all these up, it should add up to, uh, it might actually be a little bit less than 40 bytes, but, but the integers are gonna take up uh, four bytes um, or 32 bits. So that's um, four plus four or eight, the, the, the um, um, I had to do this here um, in order to get the, the value that I wanted to into my, my um, double field here. But, but a double um, is going to actually take eight bytes um, or 64 bits here. So we got um, eight plus, uh, plus four plus four. So we got 16 so far. Uh, this is a pointer. So this is actually um, going to hold a, a memory address or so pointer to some other location in memory. Right. So in this case, um, um, we're, we're initializing the things down here. We initialize C to be the, the, the S dot C to be the address of this other variable. So we just point it to my character X over here. Right. Uh, but anyway, so memory addresses uh, actually um, um, uh, this is a 64-bit machine. So this is a little bit different from what our textbook showed um, um, for the little Indian example, where they, they were obviously working on a 32-bit machine. So in our case, uh, we got 64-bit um, memory addresses, so we would need another eight for this one, another eight bytes or 64 bits. Um, so that's what, 24 so far. This is going to take seven bytes because each character takes one byte. Um, so that would be 31. Um, a short is half of, of an integer. So that's another two. So that's 33. And then we got another four here. So there's actually 37 um, 
bytes total in this structure here. And notice though that we said that we had 40, right? Um, and you can see that the, the, the values uh, in here, I mean, you know, if, if you, um, I actually put one, 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 two, one, three, one, four into A, um, and that's an integer. So if I print it out, we would get that. But but so that's presumably you know the the decimal value of one 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 two one three one four, right? Likewise for B, we, we put in two one two 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 three two four, just so we can see the find those in memory here in just a second. But if you print out that one, the float value of it, you get this. But but you know we we talked about this all the way back in chapter ten how you represent like uh, the, the IEEE 754 standards for float. So presumably this, um, if we go back and figure it out, this hex decimal, the bit pattern of that ends up being this floating point value, right? So, um, also notice that, that here's the, the memory address for C that we ended up putting into our field C here. If you count this up, uh, remember, so how many, how many bits does each digit of a, a hex encoded digit uh, have? There's actually four bits, if you remember, for each one of these. If you count these up, um, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, there's only 12, right? Um, so that implies that this is only representing 48 bits instead of what I just claimed, 64. Uh, it turns out, um, um, I had a link to this somewhere. Uh, maybe I should put an announcement again, but um, um, this is not uncommon on current 64-bit machines. Um, um, a lot of them are cheating a little bit, uh, but, but, but really it, it uses 64 bits for the address. It, it just um, 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 only displays the first 48 bits because they routinely don't use the upper um, eight um, or the upper um, uh, 16 bits. Um, uh, they're all set to zero here. So, but anyway, um, there's that. Um, and let's see where the address in memory of um, my structure S is, okay? So here's another address. So notice it's actually in memory right after it. So after, after zero F, um, uh, you know, DD zero F would be DD one zero, right? So, so these are actually kind of next to each other in memory. Um, now I'm gonna use a command um, to uh, actually print raw memory here uh, for my debugger. Um, so I want to print out, uh, or I want to examine memory, which is what the X is. I'm going to examine 40 bytes of memory. Um, I, I want to examine byte by byte, so that's the B. And um, Oh, um, I want to examine them, uh, the format. Um, I want to have them formatted as hexadecimal numbers. Um, and then I, and then I want to print them out byte by byte. So hopefully I got that right. Um, no. Um, oh, and, and we want to display this structure here that's currently in memory. So we want to display memory starting at this address here. Right? Um, and um, I'm also going to display this as ASCII characters instead of hexadecimal numbers here, right? So first of all, looking at this, the, the, the first row that you see actually corresponds to um, the first four uh, Um, oh, uh, here, I did it twice, so it displayed more memory. So, so here's, here's my, um, um, memory actually for the A field here. So, so notice it's got the, the, you can see that it has the one, one, 
one, two, one, three, and one, four in there, right? Because we had assigned it those values. Now notice that, that basically addresses are going um, from, um, so, so this is memory address one, zero, where this byte is in memory. And then this is address one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, one, seven. And we come down to one ace. So we're going from lower, you know, from, towards zero, so lower memory addresses to higher memory addresses, okay? But as you should be able to see here, I mean, this is a little Indian because at the lowest address, we've actually got the lowest um, significant um, um, eight bits here, right? Because 14 ended up being at the lowest memory. If I was writing this um, out, so, so for, for people kind of, um, uh, English speakers and 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 lots of, of people, uh, lots of other cultures. You know, you would that, that write things from left to right. We would normally write the digits, um, you know, in, in this order: one, 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 two, one, three, one, four. Right. Uh, but but if you look at it from low to high for memory, uh, you'll see that they're in the reverse order. So it's not really kind of natural for people who normally write their digits from the most significant bits on the left, most significant digits on the left to the least significant digits on the right. Okay? But anyway, that, that's what little Indian is. And if you looked at, if I did this on, on, a, on an ARM machine, um, um, well, um, as we talked about um, uh, last week, uh, apparently ARM has a bit you can, you can specify, so it'll do either little Indian or big Indian. But I think by default, um, it does the big Indian. So you would find that at the lowest memory address would be one one on a big Indian machine, then one two one three one four, which would be a little bit more natural uh, for people who are used to writing their numbers from left to right. Okay. Um, and then what was this about? Because my my next field was actually oh it was the pad. Okay, so so I guess that explains that. Uh, I had another one in here I forgot to mention, but we did uh, we did um, um, initialize it to zero, right? But I did count that up when I counted up as our total of thirty seven bytes here. But anyway, so that's that's where those um, um, four uh, bytes are coming from. Thirty two bits. They're all zero. Here. And you'll see that the, that the next eight bytes um, contain the 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 hex, uh, which was holding this float, this double float here. Right? Again, little Indian. So we end up with the most significant digits down at the, the highest memory location. Right? Um, the next one was was my address C, but again, remember this is a memory address. So if you if you, if you know how pointers work, what are actually in the eight bytes here were the memory address that I talked about, the the, the seven FF D zero F, right? So so you'll see that there. Although um, the the first uh, um, eight bits um, are I must have miscounted that. So it's only eight bits or zero, and then the other um, 54 are um, non-zero here, but, but that should be my memory address for the pointer that we had um, in our structure here, right? Um, F, zero F, D, D, F, 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 7 F. Um, oh no, there, there's there's the, the the zero here. So um, no, that's right. So yeah, there's, there's, and then there's two more zeros. Um, two more sets of zeros down here. But, so there's really 64 bits total for the memory address, but uh, normally when you print these out, like in C, you only see the, the top um, 48 bits or whatever. Um, okay, and then here's my final thing of alignment, uh, my, my first example of alignment. So notice that, that the, the next field is basically holding this array of seven characters, and in that array, we put character A at um, index zero, character B at index one. So that's why I printed this out again, but using characters. So here, uh, so at memory address D28, you can see the character array that I just put in there, right? But notice, um, you know, um, 
it puts index zero at the lowest memory address in index one. So, so these end up in left to right order, right? Um, because again, this isn't a number. We're not It's not the computer that's representing the integer or the float um, that's doing this little Indian. You know, it's, we're representing an, an array of characters. So we end up with index zero at the lowest memory address followed by the next one, the next one, next one, and so on, right? Um, and in this case, even though we only had seven memory addresses, um, this is an example of alignment that I may have mentioned once or twice. Um, when you compile things in C, it doesn't like to, like for example, the structure, it doesn't like to um, create structures that have unaligned um, fields, right? So if I had immediately started my short um, after this, um, right here in memory, so right here um, after my array. Um, so if, if I admittedly started my short, which I put the, the values uh, 51 and 52 in, which you can see here, but but if it hadn't done this alignment, those two values would have been ended up here and here. Um, uh, but it doesn't do that be, because it, it, the, the, the C compiler is trying to keep alignment because if, if, you, if your values aren't aligned, um, it will cause multiple, we, we talked a little bit about this, it, it can cause multiple cycles needed, um, you know, to, to, to first fetch this aligned values on the bus to get the first one of my short, and then I'd have to, to fetch these to get the second one of my short if we didn't do this alignment here, right? So that was my short 5152 end up being down here starting at D30 memory address after we this this bit here or this byte here is an alignment byte put in by the C compiler. Um, and then we have the 61626364. So again, also notice that that it aligned. So it didn't stuff my last integer. So, so F was another integer at the end. It didn't stuff that. Um, um, right up next to the short, because that also wouldn't have been aligned on um, a, a four byte or 32 bit boundary, right? So, and so overall, the reason why we ended up with 40 bytes total in the structure is because we had one alignment byte here and two here, plus the 37 that was in my data for a total of 40 there. Um, okay, so anyway, you know, um, if you've never kind of gone down and examined memory down kind of at that level, it's, it's good. I mean, this, this directly, you know, connects up with some of the, the stuff we've been talking about in this class. So, you know, things like alignment, uh, the little Indian, big Indian sorts of issues. Um, um, and, and this will help us kind of with our memory addressing that we'll talk about here kind of in the second half of the class. Um, and um, um, some other issues as well. So, all right, so any questions about that? Not for me. Okay. So um, I think, you know, um, this, I think I'm gonna go ahead and take my break now. It's be a good place to, so we haven't started with our materials for this week, uh, but let's go ahead and take five minutes, it's 8.15, so we'll go to 8.20. Um, I need to get a drink of water here. I've already been losing my voice. Um, and then we'll start with, with chapter 13 uh, with our, our stuff materials for uh, this week then. All right. Can I, can I ask you a little question? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. I've, it's just not really just for well, just looking at your memory addresses and everything. Uh -huh. Is this what they're referring to about buffer overload? And um, does well, that have something to do with the alignment, the padding? Kind of, yeah. I mean, buffer overflow would uh, would happen. Like, for example, if I allocate the structure, but if I were to do something like, um, how can I do like, like for, for D here. So if I do something like um, um, set, uh, I think I can do this. I have to remember my, my debugger commands. But if I were to set D, um, yeah, D, 
uh, I'll say 10 to be character X. Okay. Um, I should be able to do something like set variable, oh, set D10. Oh, I'm sorry, set uh, S dot D10. So my field is D in the S structure. So, so yeah, I did it finally there. So if I was to do that, now if you look at this, um, it will actually write the, um, um, well, we should see that we've overwritten some memory, right? So I end up with the X over here, but I actually wrote past the end of my D array and I kind of cloud, or actually I ended up sort of being safe. I ended up on one of these two um, alignment bytes, right? But, but that's kind of an example of, of overflow. So if you're doing stuff past the end of memory, uh, and, and a buffer overflow attack, if you kind of know that, for example, there's a password right here, a little bit past the end of D, I could actually write in um, um, a different password or something like that. So that's kind of a, um, a, a quick example of, of how buffer overflow happens in programs and why it can be a security issue. So. Okay. All right. Okay, let's take a quick five. Okay, um, let me go ahead and get started again here. Um, so I can probably probably you know that there's um i mean chapter 13 is as big as as previous ones but um um i don't know you may not may or may not agree but um i, I thought the stuff was um relatively straightforward most of it right so anyway so for um our current chapter um we're diving even further into some of the issues about instruction sets and the design at the processor level design decision. So about kind of the trade-offs you make, uh, you know, when you're designing your uh, instruction fields and, and the format of your instruction and um, um, your different addressing modes and things. So, so, so we're talking about addressing modes and the instruction format, the, the, the fields um, in particular, things like that. So. Um, So as, as we mentioned in our previous chapter, um, I mean, our machine instructions um, consist of an operator, but then we have to have some data for those operators to work on. So we have to have some way um, down at the instruction set definition to specify the, the locations of the data or, or the values of the data to perform our operations with, right? Um, so that means that, um, as, as we've already seen, that, that um, you know, typically our machine instructions have to have, um, um, have to specify some operate, so, some operands, so some addresses um, from which it can get the values to, to perform the operations on. So, um, So anyway, if you're down to trying to design a good instruction set, um, I mean, there's lots of trade-offs. Um, so, I mean, you can get everything you want, you know, so you can have like lots and lots of, of, of different types of instructions and they can all then uh, have two or three operands so that you can um, directly address um, any location in memory, but you know, if you go to that kind of extreme, you would end up with um, a very large instruction. Um, so, so a, a very large number of bits needed to specify all that information for a single instruction, right? Um, and that's going to have lots of of issues, um, lots of um, um, performance effects. So. Um, 
So anyway, to keep the format size manageable, um, we have to make compromises. You know? So so so, so uh, we might have to, um, like we've already seen, we, we, we might try and restrict ourselves to, to two addresses instead of three, even though you know there's a natural argument to be made that you want to have your two operands and then the, the destination um, where the, the result goes specified as a third operand. But often um, we stick with two where the destination is implied. Um, uh, but, but yeah, another trade off, though, is that how you specify those operands is this is what the addressing mode is about. So, so we need some way uh, of indicating, you know, where in memory um, it should get the values to perform the operations on. So the book has, has, has a, um, this category of what, seven um, common addressing modes. So again, you know, um, when we look at the particular sort of addressing modes in the x86 architecture and the ARM architecture, you'll see that that um, um, they have these, but, but, but they have more or they have uh, subclasses of some of these, right? But, but this is a kind of a good general list that, that most uh, ISAs um, will have something like all, of, well, like most of these. So, um, so yeah, and I don't know if I need to go in, into these too much. Ho hopefully, um, um, this basic set um, is, is, is relatively understandable. Um, there's nothing too complex here, I don't think. So immediate is really where the value is just encoded uh, in the operand itself, right? So to me, this is kind of like, like uh, a constant um, um, in, in a high level programming language, okay? So, but anyway, so for the machine instruction, the bits here are just interpreted as like an unsigned integer, right? They're, they're not interpreted as a memory address or as, as, a, as a, um, a floating point, 754 um, formatted uh, floating point value or, or whatever. Um, so, So it's not too common that we can do lots of things. So, so often maybe when we're first initializing a few locations to initial values, you might be able to use uh, some you know, immediate addresses or your, or your compiler might be able to create some instructions with immediate addresses, right? So instead of allocating um, a memory location to hold the, the value zero and then transloading that value zero into a register, you might just directly do a load with an immediate value of zero to uh, initialize a register to zero, for example, save a memory reference in that way. So, um, so then after that, the, the most, so most of the time, though, our data has to be out in main memory. Or, you know, thinking back to the, 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 the memory hierarchy, you know, um, somewhere in memory, right? So, so most of the stuff like the caching levels and things are kind of hidden from the, the, the processor's um, control uh, unit here. So, so as far as the processor is concerned, um, for direct or indirect memory addressing, um, it's, it's just in main memory and, and somewhere else takes care of, well, if it happens to be in cache level one, that we get it from there um, instead of going out all the way out to main memory or whatever. So, so direct, um, kind of as the name says, is the simplest. So here we interpret the operand field bits, um, the, the, the address field uh, for a direct as, as, as a memory address, a main memory address, okay? So to get the actual operand, then you have to do um, a memory reference. You have to, to either load or store that value um, um, that's referenced by that, that direct memory address there. So, um, So the big disadvantage, so this is simple, the simplest kind of idea, the big disadvantage, um, it, does, it does require one memory reference, but another big one though is, is that in order to reference any location memory, 
you would have to use the number of bits for this address field uh, that's equal to the number of bits for your uh, machine architecture, basically, you know, for, for your, 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 your memory um, address size, right? And that can be a lot of bits. So like for 64-bit address memory, to, to be able to address anything in all of, of memory, you'd have to set aside a full 64 bits. And normally, machine structures don't do that, right? So as you see, as we'll see from the x86, what 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 they kind of do is uh, that they support some kinds of direct addressing, but there's a lot fewer bits, and it's assumed that you are on some particular page or segment of memory, so you end up adding the current segment to the the restricted number of bits that you have for your direct address. Um, indirect addressing. Um, can kind of overcome this disadvantage of the limited address space because basically what you're doing is the address, you have, you have to do two memory references. So, so the address in your, um, in your instruction fields is really just a, a pointer to a location in memory that itself holds another memory address, okay? But since this can be a full, you know, so this can point to um, a full memory address. So, so this, this memory address might only be one word, but, but, but maybe, maybe the eight words after this holds a full 64-bit memory address, okay? So then you can interpret the eight, eight words of memory here as pointing then to the actual location where the operand is that was being referenced by the original instruction, right? So if, if, if it's not clear to me, this is really, you know, if you've ever done stuff with pointers in C, this is what we're talking about. So, so what you have here is not the, 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 the direct location of the variable, you know, of, of the operand value. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a place to memory that actually holds a memory address. So this is a pointer that then points to the actual operand, you know, the actual value that you're supposed to be using um, um, for the operation that you're trying to perform here, okay? Um, so yeah, I mean, that kind of overcomes the, the this, you know, if I only have, you know, 32 you know, or, or let's say 24 bits, uh, for my direct address here, I can I can only specify um, a limited amount of the total memory, right? So that kind of overcomes that. So that assumes that I can point to somewhere, but then that can can be a, a full memory address that can then point, you know, to it to a value anywhere in all of memory, right? So that's how we're overcoming um, using this indirect addressing. Um, overcoming and allowing uh, access to the full uh, address, the full memory address space, right? Um, but we have an extra memory reference, right? So for this one, we had to do one memory reference to get the operand, so, so to resolve this address and get this memory operand into the control unit for performing the operation on it. Here, we're gonna to have to do two memory references. So we're first gonna to have to do this to get the address, and then we're gonna to have to resolve that address to find the operand to get to the control unit. So we've doubled our memory references. Okay, register um, and register indirect are basically correspond to direct and indirect. Um, ex the, the only difference is instead of um, the um, bits being uh, a memory address, the bits refer to a register, okay? So this has, I mean, you know, if you've already got the value of the operand and register, um, uh, so, so, so this is the bet, and, and, you know, lots of compilers try to do this. We, we get the values into registers that we want to perform operations on, and then we use register um, addressing, right? So then to perform operations, we just have to specify which particular register has the value that we want to operate on. And, and, and we, we don't need to do, you know, so the operands are already in the processor, right? So we don't have to do a memory reference for, for the register addressing like this, right? This also has a nice advantage because normally we only have um, 
you know, like a small set of registers, like typically like 16 or 32 general purpose registers. So, you know, you only need like, like, like if I have 16 registers, I would only need four bits and I could specify each of those 16 registers with a four bit address field um, in your instruction format, right? Um, and then register indirect is, is the same, well, the, the similar idea to the memory indirect. So we could call this memory direct and memory indirect versus register direct um, and register indirect if we wanted to. Um, um, but yeah, again, the, 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 the address um, here um, would be to a location um, in memory, which would have the actual real operand that you want for the instruction. So, so again here, I mean, here there, there's kind of, if you've already got the operand in the register, you don't need any memory fetches or any, any memory references to use that operand. I'm like here you need one or you need two for these. Here you need zero, uh, but here for the, the register and direct, you would, you would need one fetch still. So this would be um, um, a location in memory that's pointing to the actual address in memory that has the operand you want to operate on. So, so that would require one fetch or one memory reference in that case. Okay, and then finally, um, we've got displacement. So as you'll see for the x86 in particular, um, there's actually lots of different kinds of, of displacement addressing modes um, on the x86 architecture. But, but this is just a general idea of, um, of um, we're basically combining, so, so mostly displacement addressing, or the, the way I think of these is they're used to combine like uh, a base address with an offset, okay? So, so that's the most basic. There, there are different ways of thinking about what you're doing when you're doing that, when you're combining two things to come up with the ultimate address. So, um, so yeah, and, and our textbook talks a little bit about some of these things um, um, uh, here under displacement addressing, like relative addressing, base register addressing, and, and so on, right? But you know, and it's most basic. Um, so often what we're doing, um, again, as you'll see, there's different ways you could do this. So the, this is one example. So we could use something where like one of the fields is a register and the other um, represents um, uh, like an offset uh, in this case, right? Or I'm sorry, I'm doing that backwards. So what they're trying to illustrate here is this field, the second field, memory address field, um, represents an actual memory address. The register has like an offset, okay? So think of this as an array where, where the address points to location zero in memory of the array, and then the register holds the actual index of the array. So what you wanna do is take the, the memory base address and then add the index to get the actual location in memory where the value is, you know, the operand in, in the array is that you're trying to process, right? And if I wanted to, to, to process all the values in the array, I could start with my register at zero. So that would, would um, uh, translate to the address zero of the array wherever the, the base of the array is located in memory. And then I could just increment the register to one to go to the next value in the array, and two and so on to process. So that, that would be an example of doing like an indexed base loop to process the, the, the values of an array that have in memory, okay? So anyway, as, as you can maybe imagine, as I'm describing this, this is used extensively. We, we have to do lots of things like this where we have a base address and like an offset um, um, to access values and things like that. So, um, so the thing I was just describing was indexing among the the the, the kind of sub 
a discussion of different kinds of displacement, right? So, um, um, so that's a very common way that you might use this sort of displacement addressing. Um, base register address. Um, um, here you might flip these. So, so the base address might be in the register. And then instead of like another address, you might have some um, offset that, that's encoded just as like a, an immediate value. So, so you might do that to do um, a base where, where, where the base address is in the register um, and, and you have an offset encoded uh, in the instruction. Right. Relative addressing is a kind of base register addressing, but um, you are doing it well, you're using the current location of the PC plus some offset to refer to data. So these are common, for example, for um, um, jump, uh, relative jump instructions, right? So, so jump back 10 steps to go back to the beginning of my loop or jump forward five um, steps to jump over the if part and check the else condition in like an if else um, set of statements. Um, all right, and then stack addressing. Um, this is probably not, well, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain. I mean, I'm not certain if there are like things that work like stack commands in, for example, x86. So, of course, if you have like a zero address stack machine, then, um, I mean, most all of your addressing is like this. Uh, and as we talked about, except for like the, the push and the pop, no other instructions actually have any address fields. So in that case, all the operands, you know, all the input operands and then the destination result operand are all implied to be the two top values of the stack. And then you push the result back onto the stack. So, so that would be stack addressing. Um, All right, so let's quickly look at the then some of the more specifics about x86 and how and ARM and how they do addressing modes here. Um, so you, you can mostly map the, the the textbook gives this list of addressing modes in the table 13.2. Um, most of these are, are pretty. You can direct pretty directly see of, of you know pretty directly map to the ones that we talked about, um, except you know all of these from displacement down to base with scale index. So all of these are are examples of, of different kinds of displacement um, modes here, right? Oh, and relative too. Relative is another example of displacement. So. Um, but you'll notice for all of these displacement ones, it uses something they call a segment register because um, the, the um, and apparently, I mean, I, I don't know if this is true or not, or if there's more than these six segment registers, but basically these work, especially for the displacement ones in the x86, as kind of like um, your what your current uh, so they call it segments so it's kind of like your current sub part of memory that you're working on and I guess you can have up to six of these at a time uh, one of these works as like a stack I believe um, but um, I think it mentions it in here um, I think the SS was the stack segment maybe. But yeah, besides that, you got C, D, E, F, and G. So that, that's basically because normally the, the address that you add on to these for displacement, um, uh, the, the address field isn't like the full 32 or the full 64 bits. It's a smaller number of bits for the address field. So um, uh, you, you can be more flexible if, if you need to, you know, so, so you, you decide to work on a particular segment in memory. So you set your segment register um, to work um, with a displacement or an offset um, somewhere on that segment register. 
And then if I need to work on a different segment of memory, I could use a different segment register or just change my segment register to move to a different segment, right? So that's why a lot there's a lot of these displacement modes because they're all kind of using that basic idea of we're, we're using these segments which, which gives the the general location and memory that we're at and then we the the address field part for all of these different displacement modes is just a, a smaller number of bits I, I don't know how many maybe it, it, it said um, maybe it said down here later on um, in our second part where we talk about the instruction format so um so anyway immediate is is like the immediate mode that we talked about um so that's that's where we're just encoding like like a, the actual value in our address field register operand um is basically a form the is is the the register um um addressing uh, the register, a direct addressing. So whatever values in the register um, we're, we're getting. And then like I said, so, so displacement um, is basically similar to the, the basic displacement that we talked about here, except, except where we have an implied, we have one of those six segment registers is specified as part of the address. And then you have your address um, offset on that segment, okay? Um, So base, so notice the difference between this is that um, um, the address, the, the offset you're, that, you're, that you're adding on to the segment register isn't just the, the, the value that's in your field, uh, you have to do a memory reference, okay? So, so the value in your, your um, instruction, your address field, uh, you first have to go to memory and fetch that, um, and then that represents um, the uh, a base offset that you add to um, your segment register. Let me go down to those here real quickly. Um, so yeah, that was our base with displacement mode. So, um, so they give a little bit of idea of how these might typically be used um, for by compilers or people writing programs with these. Uh, Um, yeah, and then, you know, maybe I'll just kind of, kind of wrap these up. So then the, the rest of these, for example, um, like, like two of these use a, a scaled, a scaling value. This is because, for example, when you're stepping through an array, um, you might not be stepping through an array that's an array of bytes. Okay. So, so like, um, in the code that I just showed you the, the, the array of characters, was actually an array of bytes. So each one of those characters fit in one byte. And if I wanted to step through each one of those characters to do something with it, like some string processing, I could just, just step through it one address at a time because, because memory, uh, each address in memory addresses one byte of, of data, right? But often I need to step through arrays that uh, like arrays of integers or arrays of doubles. So, so those hold um, uh, an array of integers. Each integer actually needs four memory locations because each one uses four bytes. Or an array of doubles, um, each double is eight bytes. So I need eight memory locations for eight bytes, right? So, so the, these two things where you have scaling um, allow you to like step through arrays. Um, like that, but where the basic value um, is not um, is not a byte, right? So in that case, like if I need to step through an array of integers, I would set my scaling index um, to four, um, and you know I, I would set the um, uh, the in index register would start at zero, so I could I could access index zero. And then, and then A would be the base address on the segment where the start of my integer array is, right? And then when S is zero, or sorry, when, when the index is zero, um, I would get the value at index zero. Now, if, and then if my scaling index was four, when my index went to one, I would get one times four. So that would skip over to, to the fourth address after the beginning of, 
my array. So that would get the, the, the next item in my array of integers, right? Um, So anyway, yeah, they describe a few of those ideas, um, but but yeah, th those kinds of modes are common because you have to do a lot of that stuff. Or or these are very useful for compiled languages to compile down to things that are using um, these kinds of addressing modes for basically for for iterating through uh, arrays of data or groups of data. So. Um, and then you have your relative. Um, so again, that was another one that we talked about on the basic ones where it's relative to the, the program location instead of um, a base address or, or your, your current segment or something like that. Um, Okay, so I think that was most things. Um, oh, um, the, our textbook um, in here talked a little bit, like for example, gives some more information. Um, uh, x86 right now, I believe this is true. You know, has has like kind of four general purpose registers, but you can you can sort of address these registers on on any of the instructions. Um, I, I can use just uh, um, uh, I can use like uh, uh, the full thirty two bits. I, I think. That there's actually like a six that, that these registers are 64 bit now. So again, our, my, the textbook I'm using might be a little bit data it hasn't been updated for 64 bit yet. I'm not certain. Um, I, I believe so though. But but yeah, I mean, there's basically so if you, if you ever look at assembly for um, an x86, you'll see these kinds of things. So if I'm just working with with the full with the 32 bits. You'll get symbolic names like EAX, EBX um, to mean I want all like 32 bits in the A register or B register or so on. If I want, if I want to work with um, um, shorts or you know um, um, 16 bits, I just use AX, BX, CX, um, and you can do byte wise. Um, and so on. Um, okay, so that was the x86. Uh, so for the arm, um, so recall, I, I, I think we mentioned this in the previous chapter as well. Um, um, actually, I mean, you know, the arm restricts all movement of data to and from the processor using like load and store instructions. So that means that that you know so that reduces removes a lot of the complexity because you don't need address fields for any for, for most of the the types of instructions that, that I usually think of as instructions um, like um, well anyway, you, you don't need it for any of the arith arithmetic or logical kinds of instructions because they only work on registers. Um, uh, so, so you do need addresses, but but they are going to specify the registers that the values are in, not um, general memory addresses. The only the only things that can specify general memory addresses are loads and, and stores. Okay. Um, um, our, our our textbook, um, you know, gave. Talk a little bit about the ARM instruction set uh, or addressing modes here. So, so they mentioned that uh, it might be, I mean, it's certainly uh, simpler than, than x86, although it might be somewhat more co complex, the, the different addressing modes than you might expect, um, uh, thinking about a risk machine here. Um, So anyway, I guess like load stores, basically, um, uh, mostly use types of indirect um, memory addressing, um, and and kind of dis and, and some forms of displacement addressing. So.
Um, okay, yeah, so, so load and store are the ones mostly that, that do things to and from uh, memory. So I already mentioned that the data processing instructions uh, use either immediate or register um, addressing um, to get the operands. So you have to rely on loading stuff into operands in order before, first before you can start using them. Um, um, so branch instructions also aren't really using uh, references out to memory. Um, um, Although x86, you typically don't use those. You tend to use um, relative addresses, or uh, here they're, they're saying that they use immediate um, addressing, you know, media, meaning that you've got the actual kind of, uh, like if, you, if you're doing like a relative address, a, a relative jump, um, you've got the, the amount of, of locations you need to jump forward or backwards encoded in the field as, as, as like a constant or as, as you know, the, so the bits in the address field give you the um, actual amount you need to jump forward or backwards. So, um, All right, so yeah, that, that was, you know, most of the stuff. Yeah, the, there's a few other things like the pre-index and post-index um, that were talked about in this section here. Um, okay, so let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's go on to instruction formats then. Um, so after you kind of decide the addressing modes, that you want to support in your instructions, um, you know we have to actually define the fields, the, the, the layout of the bits of an instruction. You know, so um, I mean you, you have to include the opcode. I mean, it wouldn't make sense if you don't have some bits that um, specify which operation uh, is going to be um, executed. And of course, you know, there's however many opcodes you want to have in your instruction set, that is going to imply the number of bits that you're going to need, at least at a minimum. Um, and then, of course, you have to specify your operands. Um, so, you know, it, you know, implicitly or explicitly, you have to have some operands. Um, um, but, you know, as we've already talked about, some could be implied. Uh, but each explicit operand in an instruction um, is going to have to use some sort of addressing mode that we, we just discussed, um, and you're going to have to set some bits aside to specify, you know, the address that you want to use for that instruction. So, um, so yeah, I mean, your, your most basic decision um, is, is kind of what your fundamental length is going to be for your instruction format, right? Um, usually, you know, you, you want to keep that to, to, to something like the, the natural transfer size of the number of bits, like to and from your bus, for example. So, you know, uh, for 32 bit machines, you, you normally wanted to keep it to 32 bits. So now with 64 bit machines, maybe people could start de designing thing and in, uh, instruction formats um, all the way up to 64 bits. Um, but yeah, typically they're more like 32 bits, right? Um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, there's lots of trade-offs here, you know, so if you have lots of instructions, you're gonna need lots of bits um, in order to specify which instruction you want. Um, but then that is gonna, you know, the, the, if you have your instruction length that, that you need to, to fit your instruction format in, if you have lots of bits for the instructions, that leaves less bits for the addresses, so that limits your addressing modes. So, um, so yeah, instructions probably should be equal to the memory transfer length or some multiple of it. Um, 
so somewhat surprisingly, um, um, there is another, I mean, you can squeeze some stuff out of this, like, like x86 actually has variable length opcode. So that means that not all um, opcodes use the same number of bits as others, right? And so, so the the so for some types of op uh, instructions, you only need uh, some number of bits, but then for other instructions, you need extra bits um, to specify the opcode. Um, So I believe, I mean, for the most part, ARM um, architectures uh, tend to stick to fixed length opcodes and, and, and a fixed length um, instruction format uh, as well. So, um, again, so, so yeah, I mean, the section is, is again, a, a big discussion about a lot of the, the design trade-offs of different things. Um, so, and, and, you know, besides the length of the instruction, there's lots of trade-offs then with the different addressing modes and which ones you're going to, going to um, allow in your um, instruction formats and, and, and which you're going to have to restrict or not use. So, um, so yeah, these are all kind of decisions. So, so a number of addressing modes, uh, number of operands, you know, like two operand or two address architecture or one address or whatever. Um, so, of course, registers are, are kind of a big win. So, so, I mean, lots of instructions use register addressing, uh, re either registered, you know, directly in the register or register indirect. So, where the, the, the register is, is a location in memory pointing to. Um, because, you know, typically if you only have eight to 32 kind of general purpose registers, you only need, you know, three to um, um, five bits, six bits um, to specify which register you want to work with, with your um, operation. So. Um, so a lot of these uh, architectures, like, like x86, there, there's different kinds of groupings of registers. So you know you might have um, a set of bits in your instruction field that that specify a register, but um, um, they, they could be referring to either one set of registers or another. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you have two different sets of 16 registers, you've got a total of 32, but you, you only really need four bits um, to specify which, if, if there's some reason why, like which set is implied by the app code or some other, re some other way that, that the, the set of registers is, is implied, right? And um, I, I mean, you know, the stuff is, is, is all, kind of all these things are used just because you know there's you need to pack as much as you can down into the limited space you have for um you know your instruction length right so 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 you have you have to get kind of clever on on all the things you do to to get the the power that you need while um, um not affecting performance by having huge um instruction formats and, and huge number of instructions and things. So, um, so yeah, I mean, e even the, the, the instruction length themselves, so I'm talking about the, the full instruction um, um, can be variable length or fixed length, right? Um, with the advantages and disadvantages that you would, um, that you would expect, you know. So, you know, variable length is certainly more complex. So, so that adds more complexity to the kind of the circuits and things you need to um, interpret the, the variable length instructions. Um, but that can help you, you know, get more variety of opcodes and, and, and give you more flexibility and things like that. So. Um, So, 
So I probably, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've already taken too long tonight, so um, I, I won't, I don't think I'll get a chance to, to talk about uh, some of the examples of some other um, instruction format designs, but, but they talk a little bit about the PDB um, um, 8 and PDP 11, uh, oh, PDP 8 and 10 and 11 in this, in the VAX system as well. Um, definitely good to read through that stuff. So, so there, there's some more kind of help in understanding some of the trade-offs uh, on these, these things. If you read a little bit about the design decisions for the PDP uh, series that they have in here. So, um, all right, so real quickly, kind of just to wrap this up, um, although I do have one more thing that I wanted to show here tonight after this, but um, um, there's, there's a little bit of discussion about then the, some, some specifics about the x86 instruction format um, and also about the ARM instruction format. Um, oh, there's also the assembly language section here. Um, so yeah, so we've mentioned the x86 instruction format is actually using a variable length uh, instruction format. Um, so um, there's actually kind of a, a prefix that can vary from it. So, so there might not be any of these. Um, um, so, so the prefix could be zero one. So this, this is showing kind of all the variability for each one of these, right? So at, at the minimum, so there has to be at least one byte um, uh, for the instruction, right? So I don't know what the smallest one is. So, so there's, there's probably some opcodes in x86 that don't need any operands. Like an increment instruction might be implied to increment. Well, even for increment, you, you're probably specifying like a register you want to increment or something. But um, um, but but yeah, so you have to specify the opcode. But otherwise, uh, all these other fields could be optional in the x86 instruction format. Um, So anyway, like in the instruction prefix, instruction prefix. So one thing you can do is specify the segment. Um, I believe that this is different from the, the segment register. So if you, if you want to override the segment register and go to some different segment, um, you specify that somehow here, um, and then it won't use the segment register um, to to to. Um, to resolve any addresses that you have. Um, uh, yeah, then you have your opcode. So some of this opcode is that some of the bits specify that thing that we talked about, whether the, the data is, I think also eight bits, so, eight, so you can use a, a byte you know, 8-bit, 16-bit, a 32-bit, and maybe 64-bit nowadays, I'm not certain. So, um, and, and then these mod RMs um, um, are mostly where the bits that specify whether, you know, you're doing like some memory addressing or you're doing some register addressing. And, and then I, I believe that the, if you're doing register addressing, you get the um, register bits down here in the register opcode, maybe. Um, um, and, and yeah, the scale. Uh, oh, oh, and then there's some more business. So like when you're doing some of that scale um, index displacement addressing, th those things are specified over here somehow, I believe. Uh, again, I think these, you know, it's only two bits, not big enough to, 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 to give you like a, 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 an actual scale. I, I mean, two bits would big, be big enough to specify a scale of one, two, or three, right? But um, um, these bits must specify the register where, where the scale value is held and things like that. Um, 
All right. And then, yeah, there, there's zero to four bits for these things. These things are generally the addresses that we talked about. So if you have an immediate value, um, might be zero to four bytes for your immediate value. If you have some displacement, um, so all of our modes where you have an address, you can have zero to four bytes um, um, for an address um, uh, to use as a displacement or something like that. Um, All right, and then for the ARM, um, so, so it's relatively uh, quite a bit simpler. Um, it uses a, a fixed instruction, fixed length instruction format. Um, so I think we mentioned this before, um, um, all ARM instructions in the full ARM standard actually have a condition code. So um, you can actually, um, execute individual instructions conditionally uh, based on, you know, um, status word flag settings right now, right? So that kind of lessens the need for conditional jumps. Um, if you can just set one or multiple instructions to, to execute conditionally or not. Um, as it talks about here, th those are kind of dropped. Uh, so there, there's these thumb, thumb um, instruction set and thumb two instruction set, which were uh, attempts to uh, come up with uh, kind of subset designs of ARM to get it so you could fit it down into like a 16 bit um, or, or narrow memory address, uh, memory data bus, right? Um, so these are like, like subsets and they do some things like drop these, I think it was the condition codes maybe some other things um, so you can fit these down into like a 16-bit format, but still have most all of the um, operate uh, the operations and things. Um, but yeah, there, there's, there's kind of like three different sorts of um, uh, or, or there's there's a couple of what they call instruction types. Um, and then like the four or five bits after that is the actual opcode. So, you know, the way that these work, the, they, they describe it here, but um, uh, where, where is that? Um, Uh, anyway, so so like you know, so, so some of these are like one of these. Oh, oh they're, they're, yeah, they describe it just on the side here. So like any, anything with zero zero are the the data processing um, uh, with immediate shift or register shift or uh, immediate. So the the main thing you know the the easiest thing to understand is so anything that's like a load or store using uh, an immediate. Is going to be zero one zero in these bits. So, so and and then it's going to have these bits set. Um, um, in order to load or store um, in different ways from um, you know an immediate address. So this is like a, 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 um, um, a something that's um, interpreted. Those bits are interpreted as an actual memory address that we're doing the load and store for. So. And like zero on one, so so kind of what these are are like a grouping, and then um, and then the other bits uh, for some of these specify the particular operation. So so basically, like the data processing are going to be uh, think the you know uh, multiply and add and, and different and, and logical operations and things like that. So you can either do those. Um, with immediate shift or register shift, um, whatever that's kind of about here. Okay. Um, okay, um, yeah, so 
And then, then the last section was a little discussion about assembly languages. Um, so maybe I'll just kind of quickly summarize this that, um, you know, I, I mean, if you know the, the format, the, the instruction format of the machine that you're trying to write um, a program for, I mean, in theory, you could just come up with the, the bit patterns that you need for your, your the, the program that you want to write. Um, and if like if you had a hex editor, you could you could in theory, you know, um, edit a file um, and use use um, hex values to get the bit patterns that you need. And that would be one way of writing a program. That's kind of what what you actually end up getting from your compilation to uh, into an assembly language and then and then assembling into your final binary program, right? So if you were to look at at, at the raw binary program um, and interpret the bits, you should see that they um, um, you know are, are interpreted as the, the the layout for the bit patterns for the instruction formats that we were just talking about. Whatever your you know target binary program machine architecture is targeted for. Um, oh, by the way, there, there seems to be a typo here. So um, each one of the, 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 the first two columns here were supposed to be the, um, the, the, the bits for memory address 101, but there really should have been, um, each one of these is holding, um, um, so it looks like in this example, the, this machine was kind of like the hypothetical machine from like chapter three or four of our textbook. So each address was actually supposed to be holding um, 16 bits or, or two bytes of information. So you can kind of see that, that from the hex here. So the hex for our first one is supposed to be like, like a load from, so, so two was the, the um, um, opcode load and then 201 is the memory address that we're supposed to be loading the accumulator from. So this is supposed to be the hex of the, the 16 bits but, but yeah, there should have been, um, so there's the two um, and then the two again, but there should have been another two columns for the, the zero and one here. So they just seem to cut that off there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that would be what your binary program would look like either in, in, if you look at it in binary digits or you look at it in hex um, um, without the address actually. So one of the things about once you compile a binary program, uh, one thing you'll have, you'll, you'll have to give it to a loader to actually load it into your computer memory to start running it. Uh, and one thing for your binary program format um, is there going to be some directive to the loader of where it should be loaded into memory or some directive for the operating system of, of how you figure out what the initial load address should be um, so that you can assign some location to load your program to start running. So anyway, um, to, to wrap up on this, I mean, yeah, you, you could kind of conceivably, it'd be painful, but you could get a hex editor um, and actually create binary files that would run um, on your target machine architecture. Uh, but we don't do that. I mean, normally we've got, you know, what are these symbolic uh, assemblers? Um, so you can write things that this, this isn't really a high level language, but this, these are kind of predecessors to what we would think of as a high level language today, like, like C, which isn't that high, but C or Java or whatever you're used to. Um, so the, these use symbolic names for, for variables um, or, or actually to the final assembly program, um, we're using symbolic names both for the opcodes, uh, but then also uh, we'll, we'll use symbolic names for variables that we want to manipulate. Um, and then you just have to define a set of mnemonics um, that translate into the full set of um, um, your instruction set for your um, uh, your defined your your architecture that you're trying to target your program for, right? So all the things that we talked about, you'd have to be able to represent here. So not only the opcode, but your um, addresses um, and different ways of, of 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 representing the different addressing modes. Um, so you can specify which one you want to use for this particular opcode um, and so on. Okay. 
But anyway, yeah, so assembler. Um, so normally you write this in a plain ASCII type text file like you would with, with um, most high level languages, you'll write them in um, plain ASCII and, and they'll go through, in this case, an assembly process that will take these mnemonics um, and actually generate the binary file uh, for you. Um, that, that's specified for those. But, but unlike like a high level language like Java or something, um, um, there, there's pretty much a, a, an almost one-to-one -one correspondence between each one of these mnemonic opcodes and the, the machine instruction um, opcode that you need to assemble it down into. So, so that's basically what your assembly languages are. So. Um, all right, so yeah, it's getting a little bit late here, but uh, so I don't know, um, um, there was one more quick thing that I kind of wanted to show. Um, again, kind of another example uh, program here. Um, so again, this is, this is um, a little bit from the previous chapter, but also there's a little bit here I can show um, from the current chapter. Um, um, here as well. Um, so um, we've got a little program here that has a function that's actually a recursive function called factorial. So, so I wanted to use this um, um, just for five minutes here to kind of illustrate uh, both kind of function calls and the function call stack. So if you've never um, thought a lot about that, um, this is kind of a good, some good information to know about how programs work in general on a computer. We, we, we went over this a little bit last week, um, um, talking about it at the, at the machine uh, level, the, the instruction set architecture level, how it supports procedure calls, usually with instructions like, like a call and return instruction are part of the opcodes um, of, of of, of your your machine architecture. Um, so let me let me let me let's let's break into um, let's set a break point at my line fifty eight here before I call it for the first time. Uh, I better set another break point at the line sixty one before I call it the second time as well, and then let's run it. So here we're about to call this, this function, okay? And um, if you've ever used um, a debugger, uh, you might or might not have run across, but, but you can get what's known as the, 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 um, the, the, the current um, uh, stack. Um, so it's usually called the function call stack or just the call stack um, in the context of doing a debugger of running a debugger on code like this. Um, but uh, but um, yeah, as, as I'll talk about, I mean, this is also the same as the, the procedure call stack that we talked about in the previous chapter. So right now, if I do um, a, a BT, which stands for backtrace, um, this shows my function call stack. Um, and uh, let's do a BT full so we get all the, well, there's no local variables here. So what this is showing, I mean, if you've never thought about it, for a C programming language, main is a function just like every, any other function. It has a special purpose. It's the first function that's, that's called when you um, start running a program like I just did here. I started running um, this, this program that we're debugging. Um, but we're currently in main, um, and this is actually the location of my arguments that, that are passed in the main here, argc and argv. Um, but like any kind of symbolic debugger, we can step into it. So I'm about ready to call the, the uh, factorial function with zero to calculate zero factorial. So by definition, zero factorial is just one. Um, so we can um, do things like step in and step over, like, like if you've ever run a debugger before, um, uh, I gotta remember how I step in here. Um, uh, next goes to step over, but uh, step steps in, so I wanna do S to step in. So now I'm actually um, in the factorial function that we can see if I scroll up a little bit here, um, we're on line 28. 
So basically, this is a recursive function. We're checking the base case here. Um, so for for zero factorial, should the, the definition of zero factorial is, is defined to be one. So, so um, if, if it is zero, we should return one, which is what we're going to do here. Uh, but if you look at the, um, the stack trace, um, so now I've got two functions on my stack, okay? So um, uh, we start off in the main function, that's at the bottom of my function call stack. And in main at line 58, we call factorial. And the current top of my function call stack, all right, procedure call stack is factorial function, um, where um, um, we've got a couple of, uh, we've, we've got a local variable called n minus one result. Um, and we've got a parameter called n, which has a value of zero right now. Okay, so the reason why these are important because again we talked a little bit about this last week is that whenever you call a function or a procedure, you have to push all of the parameters and local variables onto the function call stack if you want to support full um, recurrent uh, functions, which is which is basically another similar way of, of saying recursive functions, right? Functions that can call themselves, right? Um, uh, you need that because if factorial is going to call itself, I mean, like, like this local variable n minus one result, if I have, have, if I'm called factorial, but it's called another version of factorial, I need two different places that hold the current value of n minus one result and, and also that hold parameters. Parameters work kind of just like local variables um, in a program like this as well, right? So I, I would need two different versions of that. I don't need it yet because I haven't called I haven't re-entered factorial here uh, to use that, but um, um, I can show you a little bit about it. So another thing that GDB is really powerful um, debugger. Um, I can do things like disassemble my factorial function. So this is the actual again. You know, this is running on an x86. So this is the actual code that my factorial function got compiled down into, right? So I can interpret some of this, but not all, I won't interpret, try, actually, I mean, I can't interpret all of it. I have to kind of go back and brush up on some of my x86, but, but we can see a few things. Um, so for example, uh, notice here when we're doing the compare zero to something, so, and, and this is an example of some rel some some um, um, register relative addressing. There's some register, and at some location, 14 places before the address in that register, we're comparing that value to zero and doing a conditional jump. That that's how this if is being implemented. Um, if, it, if it's not zero, we're jumping over um, down to basically. Uh, the, the um, location right here, 515E. And that's where we get compiled in the code uh, for the stuff after, right? If it is zero, so, so we jump, if it's not equal zero, if it is zero, um, um, uh, we don't jump over, we, we go into here, right? Um, what we do is we move one to EAX is one of those registers that we talked about, uh, general purpose registers. We put a one into EAX, and then we jump down to 1C, which is where we're actually returning from the function, okay? So notice we got the call and return here. So those are the instructions that we talked about last week. These are the x86 instructions for calling a procedure and returning from them. And these functions, the call procedure does some of the things of pushing um, the uh, stuff it needs to on, on the stack, your local variables and your local uh, parameters before, um, jumping to the procedure and, and notice that it's calling itself. So the call, the address it calls actually goes back to the start of my factorial function here for the call. But at the end, so if, if, if at this point, what we're gonna do is since n is zero, so, so this um, uh, here, when we're doing the compare, somehow this is resolving to my parameter n, right? Um, and if it is zero, um, um, we're not gonna jump, we're gonna put one into EAX and that's how we're returning one back to the caller, which should be the results. So, so, some, so somehow the one in the EAX register, um, after we jump here and do the leave and then return, 
um, is going to be used by main as the result that's returned back from factorial here, right? Um, so so um, um, before I move on then, so what is this here? Basically what this is, is RBP is, is pointing to the, stop, the, the top of my stack pointer, I'm sorry, of my, my, my function call stack. So, so RBP must have, um, and, and I think I can print these out if I remember. Um, get spelled right. Um, um, or maybe I have to examine it. Um, anyway, um, um, I mean, you know, that that's just um, um, uh, a register and it has content. It has it basically probably has a memory address. So it basically has uh, a memory address to the current top of the stack. Okay. So what happened before I called factorial is I pushed on um, things onto my stack so that I could represent, or, or, or um, I mean, basically that's what the call does. So, so um, it pushed on things, uh, it set aside memory on the stack to hold the value for in and the in minus result. So any parameters and local variables, right? Um, so, so the value that, that's 14 from the top of the stack um, is, basically where um, the parameter in ended up being um, in this compiled code here if I could if I could print it out um, uh, I can't remember how to um, how to print out. Try one more time. Anyway, that's not that important, but but uh, yeah, if we looked at that, it would just be a memory address. Um, uh, but but we could go and look at the actual stack and then look at the value, um, you know, 14 down from the stack. And you would find basically that's that's the, the value of the parameter in, which should be one at this point, um, you know, um, that we can kind of see from our, our function call stack. Um, um, if I bring my function call stack back up here, um, or in is zero. So, so, so yeah, we were cal calculating factorial zero here. So, um, all right. So let, let's let me let me uh, step out of this function here. So it's going to return one. Um, now we're back into main, right? So after the, basically I stepped over here, but we 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 jumped down here, put one into eax, and then we jumped down here um, to one fc, which call it which. which ended up re the, causing the return to happen, that popped off the um, um, factorial uh, frame from my function call stack. Now we're back into the main function, right? Um, at, at line 61 here. So um, at this point, I'm about ready to call factorial five. So if, if, I, if I step in here, um, I should set a breakpoint Let's set a break point um, at line 35 here before just before we return. So, um, so if I were to continue, I would I would end up breaking now on my first call of factorial. Um, so, so now we're one we're one deep into our function call stack. We called factorial with a value of n of five. Um, n wasn't zero, so we, we, we skipped over. So now we're doing this code here where, where we jump over the if and, and start doing this other stuff. So again, what, what we do here is that, um, um, again, if you look at this, we pull off the, that same value, uh, minus 14 from the stack, that's n again. We, we pull that off and we put that in register eax, um, 
and then we subtract one from EX. So this is an example of, of, of an immediate value. We're subtracting uh, the, the, the value one, not, not a memory reference, but um, um, the, the immediate value one that gets subtracted from EAX. Um, and the result should get put back into EAX um, again. And then we move that to EDI before we call the, the call again. So, and, and again, this is going to call recursively the factorial function. Right. The, the purpose of this move is that we've we've moved. Um, so now E A X has um, uh, four. The, the next value that we want to call factorial recursively with, um, and that's going to get pushed onto my call stack um, by the call um, opcode here. Right. So. Um, if I continue on, um, I'll break, but I'm now, uh, I'm now too deep in my function call stack. So main called factorial with n of five, factorial recursively called itself with n minus one, so factorial four. Um, if I continue on, um, we're now three deep. So, so when, when factorial had n of four, uh, it called itself, uh, subtracting one from n, we're now in three, and so on, right? So we we'll keep piling stuff onto my my procedure call or my function call stack, right? And each one of these stacks, um, uh, again, you know, the way this works is, is that that all the code is the same because they're all referring to the value of n and the value of n minus one result here um, from the top of the stack. But but every time a new stack frame is put onto the stack, um, it it allocates new memory to hold all the parameters and local variables so that the same reference from the top of the stack is correct for my for whatever my current stack frame is. And each one of my stack frames has a different copy of my parameter in and this local variable in minus one results, right? Um, so keep doing this. So now we continue on, we're, we're down to the factorial in equals two factorial or n equals one. And then, um, oh, I shouldn't have continued from there. So, so when n was one, it called it was zero, but we didn't hit any more breakpoints because we returned one. When we returned one, that, you know, that, that popped off the, um, um, the, 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 the high, highest call stack by hitting return, that returned back to the uh, n equals one um, and, and so on, popped off all the, the, the stack frames um, and finished it off there. So. Okay, so anyway, yeah, I wanted to go through that just uh, to show you a little bit of actual x86 assembly. Um, you know, I can point out, so, so there's, there's at least two of, of the addressing modes that we talked about here. So there, there, there's something where we're using um, um, a rel uh, uh, we're using a register um, and a relative offset. So this is an example of some kind of a displacement mode from a, a, a base address and a register, right? Notice most of our opcodes are two address um, opcodes here for the x86. Um, and we've got some a uh, couple of, of examples of immediate of, of you know just constant value. So, so storing you know assigning one in here so we can return one. Um, um, having one here so we can do a subtraction of one for the uh, subtraction um, here. Um, oh, and and um, you know I mean I'll just. I can point out here. So this, this subtract twenty here. This was part of the stuff for the the function call setup. So so again, this is manipulating the function call stack. So by by subtracting twenty, we've moved up and given room on the top of the stack um, for um, you know for our our local variable in and stuff, right? So as so, a um, that's part of the, the manipulation that, that's happening here. And, and it's pushing the return value. Um, so, so this is part of the call return. So, so um, it's like pushing the current program counter here somewhere um, so that when it hits return, it can pop that off um, and, and return back to the correct um, location like, like we talked a little bit about. So. Um, all right. So yeah. Um, 
I'm kind of um, talked out there. That, that was all the things that I kind of wanted to um, bring up today. It's getting kind of late. Uh, does anybody have any final thoughts? You want to ask any final questions about things here? No, there's plenty here to think about. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, um, yep. I mean, I guess I'll go ahead and end it there then. Everybody have a good night. Um, so we're getting close to the end. So I hope, hope you're all caught up and kind of ready for the last two, three weeks here. So, uh, yeah, that's it. I'll see you guys uh, next week then. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.